Good morning, and welcome this morning. It's a kind of a, a bittersweet duty to come up here and interrupt all of the fellowship and the conversation to start, but we're going to get us started uh, our worship hour this morning. We're, we're glad that you could all come here, given the questionable weather, we'll call it. We're glad you could all come. Uh, a few announcements to get us started this morning. Uh, the rank and food pantry uh, needs list is on the back table. Um, please stay after church to set up tables for the Christmas brunch. And if you're not signed up, sign up. Or maybe it's too late. I'm not sure. But please, uh, if you would, if you're willing, please uh, stay after to help set up. It's not too late to sign up. So if you want to come to the brunch and invite uh, a friend, sign up. Um, search committee meeting this Thursday, 6 p.m. The ladies' Christmas brunch is this Saturday at 9 a.m. Uh, please sign up. The sheets are on the back table. Uh, celebrate the season will be Sunday, December 3rd, 3 p.m. at the Gibson City Bible Church. Um, Dr. Edim Agama and his wife June will be coming to our church on Sunday, December 10th to share and meet with us. Um, that'll be at 9.30 during the adult Sunday school hour. So if you want to hear about that, um, and if you're not familiar, Dr. Agama is the guy that uh, founded and operates the hospital in Ghana, you know, that, that we've been um, helping out the last couple of years. So if you want to see the guy that's got that going on, please come and, and see what uh, he can, he's showing us what he does there. Um, also, not in your bulletin, but December 3rd, we're going to be having communion. So if you, if you wish to, uh, you know, be here for that, please. Are there any other announcements that aren't in the bulletin? Oh, the new daily breads. That's right. The new day the breads are on the back table, so um, if you enjoy those, please grab one. And if you're not enjoying them yet, go grab one so you can enjoy them. Um, are there any prayer requests that aren't in the bulletin? No, I am not going to preach. <laughs> Aren't you happy? <laughs> I know this church has been praying for my husband. And I want to bring you up to date today on his condition. Uh, thank you for praying for him. And I know it's hard to pray for someone when you don't know what's going on. And I'm here to tell you what is going on. <clears throat> About the end of October, Roger was on a riding lawnmower and he was getting off and he skinned his leg a little bit. And he did not tell me for a while. A few days went by and this leg got worse and worse. And he finally said, I injured my leg and uh, pulled up his pants leg. It's in the right leg, the lower half, in the front. And I saw what was going on. I immediately said to him, go to Aaron. And uh, now, Aaron looked at it and he says, go to the emergency room now. And he did. And our story just keeps going. You see, our granddaughter, this was on November the 7th, a Tuesday. And our granddaughter was getting married Friday evening in Franklin, Tennessee. The rehearsal dinner was on Thursday evening, and as grandparents, we were invited and we were <coughs> anxious to go. Well, the ER doctor was not so good and so happy about 
us going on. But however, she said, I will allow you to go, providing that you drive two hours and then you stop half hour and walk. Two hours more and Roger, you will get out and walk. And this was to go down there so that we could prevent blood clots. And she said, I want to tell you, it just takes one blood clot to go in his lung and he will be gone. So we did. We left earlier than usual, went a halfway and got at Evansville, Indiana the first night. And during this time, Roger drove an hour, or I drove an hour, and then we got out and he walked. He drove an hour and he got out and he walked. And on we go to Nashville and to Franklin. We headed to the rehearsal dinner on Thursday night, and in the meantime, on our way down there, we went to the airport in Nashville to pick up our grandson that was flying in from Minneapolis. And we, you know how it is at an airport, you circle, you circle, you circle. And we found him easy, he came, and we headed to the rehearsal dinner together. Well, we were on Interstate 65, two miles from the place we were to meet for the rehearsal dinner, and it started to rain. Well, the car in front of us started to slow down. The brakes, the brakes came on. Roger automatically starts to slow down, but our car did not slow down. It hit the highway, the interstate, which had been dry for a long time after I understood what was going on, and the first rain that comes, it gets very slick. The car slid and really hydroplaned, <coughs> and we ran into that car. Well, I sat there in kind of a daze. I said, well, we can still drive the car. The policeman came and said, no, you can't. The radiator was hit and the fluid was all running out. Okay, Lord, now what do we do? Well, our grandson, <clears throat> our grandson-in-law, after we called Rod, our son, at the, at the dinner, they were waiting for us, came and picked us up and took us to the <coughs> rehearsal dinner. <laughs> He said, everybody down here drives crazy. <laughs> well, well, thanks, we're Yankees. <laughs> so the day of the wedding was Friday evening at six o'clock. <laughs> and the day of the wedding, instead of enjoying Franklin, Tennessee, we were calling our insurance man. We rented a car. And we tried to get home as soon as possible. But we went to a beautiful wedding at 6 p.m. My son, he escorted me down the aisle. Roger followed. We smiled. <coughs> Nobody knew. By this time, Roger's leg got no better. It was still big, swollen, and red. And our pet, and uh, we so much Oh, and at the same time, this sepsis, blood poisoning, was starting to show up. Well, we wanted our car back in Cisna Park to be repaired because they told us that it's going to take months down there to get to it. And our insurance agent started working really hard. Nashville police were so kind, so good to us Yankees. No citation was given to Roger. And we found after several trips to doctors and this and that, we ended up at the wound clinic at the Carl. Best move we've made so far. You see, they have worked on him twice now. And the second time, my son called my son-in-law that lives in Muhammad and said, will you go over there and you be at this appointment for me so we can find out what's really going on? 
Well, that happened. He was there with us. <clears throat> Everything's turning out good. Roger's anxious to come back to church. He's healing. He's helping me bake cookies. He's never done that before, and I had to kind of chuckle how he knows how to do it. He's been watching me. I'm not only a wife, a maid, a cook, but I have become Roger's nurse. I t change his dressing twice a day. His leg is starting to heal. We have a good God. Now I look back and I see all the little things that went only God could do. I give him credit today and we praise him. Roger's going to be okay. I wanted you to know as a church family what was going on. Thank you. That sounded like a sermon to me. <laughs> I just have a quick announcement. Uh, over the past couple of years, we've uh, you, uh, partnered with Grace to do the, some gifts for some of the kids in our uh, community that don't have uh, funds or the ability to, to buy gifts for their children. So they ask the kids in school what, they're, what they would like, and they make lists. And so we have some tags over here. Um, the Schumachers, Barb and, and uh, Dan dropped them off at our house last night. What it is is it's just got a list of some things on there that, that the kids wanted. <clears throat> what you do is if you want to be a part of this, grab a tag, buy the gifts, wrap the presents. I'm not wrapping any presents. <laughs> and then tape the tag to the gifts so that we know which kid gets what. Now, if you're not willing to do that or you don't want to shop like me, I hate shopping, you can donate, and if you decide to donate, the love offering box will be out. And if you write a check, please write it out to Grace Bible Church. And then with the kids, the tags haven't been taken, they'll take that money, and Barb or Dan or somebody, any, anybody but me, will go out and buy these gifts with those funds. So thank you for that. 17th, I'm sorry. That's a very important part of the It's right here. It says, make sure they're back by the 17th. <laughs> Amy should be doing this. She's the one that's been. <laughs> well, let's sing praises to this powerful God that we serve. Would you join me in singing, Behold Our God? It's 30 in the white book, and it'll be on the screen. Let's stand as we sing, please. Bearing all the 
given now to reign. Behold our God, seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore seated. Mark, would you come and share? Can you guys in the back see this? Can everybody see this? I make you a deal. If you promise to listen to me to the end, I promise I'll tell you about this and why I brought it today. <laughs> you know, after Gene gave his testimony a couple weeks ago, Bruce said he'd be after us guys to get up here and do the same thing. So I thought I'd beat him to the punch, and I said, I'll volunteer. And uh, he said, fine, you're next. <laughs> but uh, I love testimonies. I wish we would all get up here and do it, because this summer when we had the baptisms and testimonies, man, that was a great service, wasn't it? Man, I think I've been coming here since 2017. I think that was about the best service we ever had. And... Uh, if you see Bruce coming toward you with a smile on his face, don't you run away and shame on you if you tell him no. Because he wants to know your testimony. He wants to know your story. I want to know it. We all want to know it. And it's a great way to learn about each other. And we're part of a body, brothers and sisters. Hey, Gene said he was saved in Okeechobee, Florida, in a Baptist church. Well, I got saved in uh, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, on a pair of cross-country skis in the woods. And uh, you ever think about what that really means, to be saved? What, what is that? I like Jay Carty's explanation of that. He died in 2017 from cancer, but he said it's just basically boiling it down to saying yes to God. Because all your life, you're saying no. Your thoughts, your actions, your life. And finally, you get to the point where you say yes. When I was a little boy, about five years old, a Sunday school teacher said, does anybody want to get saved? And I said, yeah, yeah, me, me. And uh, she took me in a room. Pastor came and talked to me for a little while. And I don't remember a lot about that. And uh, it really didn't change my life. You couldn't tell big change in me. That was when I was five years old. Now, from five years out, well, fast forward to 19 and a half, almost 20 years old, at Christmas break, 1976, wintertime. My life at that point in time probably wasn't what I expected. My Studies at college weren't the best. My grades weren't too good. My outlook on life wasn't good. I didn't know what I was going to do. I was going to be getting out of school in a couple of months. Uh, but somebody must have painted an X on my back because a guy named Joel Kaufman kept bugging me and bugging me and hounding me. Come on, let's go to church. Let's go to Bible study. And, you know, they're going to have a getaway retreat. And we can go uh, snow skiing, cross-country skiing up there. And I thought, well, that sounds all right. I think I'll do that. So day after Christmas, December 26, 1976, a bunch of kids and went up to Lake Geneva and went to a retreat. And uh, speaker challenged us one afternoon. And I know he was talking right to me. He said, What's, what's it going to be, yes or no? Do your friends, do the people you're around know that you're a Christian? If you're a Christian, can they tell the difference in your life? Man, I did not want to hear that. I just wanted to get out of there. And uh, I knew he was talking right to me. You know, a couple weeks ago, I heard a speaker on the radio. He said there's three kinds of people. There are believers, and there are non-believers and then there's 
make believers. And I realized that guy was talking about me because I was just make believing. And uh, the meeting got over, and we could sign up and go skiing. About six or seven of us did. A couple instructors with, with us, and we were out on the trails, snow skiing, and I liked it. I had good legs from running 10Ks and ice skating and stuff, so I thought it was a blast. After a while, some of the girls got cold, and they wanted to go back. And I asked the instructor, it was starting to get dark. I said, can I stay out a little bit longer? He goes, yeah, go ahead. That's fine. Just make sure you're back by the time it gets dark. So they all took off, and I remember it was cold, but snowing a little bit, like today, windy. And uh, I came to a hill, and I slid down to the bottom of that hill. And Holy Spirit was working on me. Man, was he working on me. <laughs> you know you know how it is, right? And uh, he said, all right, as Roy Bauer would say, it's time to fish or cut bait. You got to make a choice. And he said, you know, you're a fake. And uh, this is it. It's either yes or no. What's it going to be? And boy, I just, I melted and I said, yes. If you want this life, it's yours. Because I sure ain't doing much with it. And uh, went back, came back home. A few weeks later, I was back in school from Chris, uh, Christmas vacation. And a girl who was like a big sister to me at college, her name was Brenda Fisher. I just learned this year that she passed away. Uh, she came up to me, and the Lord gave me a gift, a present, so to speak. She came up to me after class one day. She said, Mark, what is it about you? Something's different. You're dressing neat, and you're doing your homework, and you're talking in class, and you're laughing and smiling. Something happened to you. And I said, Lord, thank you, because that's what I needed to hear. That was encouraging. A couple weeks, or a couple weeks, a couple months later, got baptized with some people and became friends with a great couple named Deb and Jimmy. And uh, I can't see Jim right now, but I know he's smiling ear to ear because I'm up here talking. And uh, after that baptism, I grew like a 12-inch stalk of corn that just got shot some fertilizer. And there's three things that helped me grow. And I'm going to share them with you. One was going to church and hearing some great sermons from some great speakers and preachers from schools like Dallas Theological, Moody, Wheaton, Trinity, Solid meat, solid. Another thing was Bible studies and getting into the Word of God. And the other thing was what we called back then CCM, Contemporary Christian Music. The Jesus Movement was just 10 years old, getting steam. And man, the music, I loved it. I just couldn't soak it up enough. And uh, the rest is history. Here I am. And uh, I encourage you to get up here and share your testimony. Steve Hall, who is not here today, too bad. Steve Hall was in uh, our Sunday night Bible study earlier this year. And uh, he said something that I want to wrap up with tonight. And it hit me so profound right here. I said, man, that's me. He said... God can use a crooked stick to draw a straight line. And I thank God, and you know and he knows that I'm a crooked stick. But with his grace and his mercy, he can help me draw a straight line in the sand of time. Thank you, Maranatha. Thank you, Mark. Praise God. And if you see me coming, don't walk away. Yeah. <laughs> Let's sing Before the Throne of God Above. It's in hymn number 12 in the white book. You can stand. Before the throne of God above 
I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. To look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased with his blood, my life is hid with Christ on high with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. <clears throat> I bow before the cross of Christ and marvel at this love divine. God's perfect Son was sacrificed to make me righteous in God's eyes. This river's depths I cannot know, but I can glory in its flood. My Lord Most High has bowed down low and poured on me His glorious love and poured on me his glorious love. You may be seated. Would you join me in prayer? Dear Lord, we come to you this morning in this season of thanksgiving. We just thank you for the grace you've shown us that, and the mercy you've shown us. 
in sending your son to die for us. We thank you that you want to save us, Lord. Thank you for Mark's testimony this morning. We just praise you for that. And now we want to thank you for your goodness toward us as a congregation in providing the men to fill our pulpit for this time that we're without a pastor. We have been so blessed, and we just thank you for that. And we just praise you for your providing this for us. We thank you for their willingness to come and share. And this morning, we thank you for Dave and Renee coming to, to minister to us. We just thank you for their, their ministry and, and what they've done for you. But we, we are need, needing help right now, and we just thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for the, the folks that are serving on this search committee. I ask, Lord, that you would reveal things to them that you want for us that you would direct them in the way that they should go as they search for a new pastor. And we just ask that you'd be with them. Lord, I want to praise you for Raj's recovery. We just pray that you'd continue to work in him. And that, that and I thank you for, for allowing me to feel better, Lord, in this time. And we just thank you for the projection that you've shown us. Lord, we want to pray for some individuals this morning. We will always want to remember Ron and Mary as they're in nursing homes and cannot be with us, Lord. We ask for your encouragement upon them and that you would be with them as they as they live their lives for you in, in the homes that they're at. Lord, we have Deb Riddle, who's disappointed that she didn't have a procedure done this week, and we just pray for her. We pray for encouragement. Help her to be calm as she waits. Help us to be help her to be patient. Lord, we think of Jackie and Linda and Larry and Raj and Guy and Judy and Judy Judy Edelman also. Lord, these are people that we've been praying for for some time, and we pray that you uh, work in their lives and be healing. Lord, we hear the news and we have to think about our servicemen, Lord, and we want to pray this morning for Connor as he is serving you. Lord, we ask for protection for him, and Lord, we ask for protection for all the men and women that are willing to serve and protect us. Lord, we also remember the turmoil that's in the Middle East, and we have a local boy that's there we pray for Jason. We pray that you'd give him strength, give him resources to minister those in, in Gaza and Israel. We thank you for his willingness to be there, and we ask you for your protection upon him. And now, Lord, as we look into your word, we ask you to touch our hearts, open our ears and minds to what you have for us this morning. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we're privileged to have David Hohulin here. David is the son of Dick and Lou Hohulin, who were missionaries that were sent out from this church years and years ago. Uh, David has retired as the minister of uh, Upper Room Fellowship. He's working full-time with men for missions, and we're just humbled that he would come and share with us today. I'd start off by just uh, thanking you uh, and and letting you know how much we appreciate you. Um, you were faithful supporters of my parents for many years. I bring you greetings from my mother. Uh, she is doing well at 91. She's uh, sharper and in better shape than I am, so <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, my dad went home to be with the Lord two years ago, but I'm sure he would express his gratitude to you all for your help in their work in the Philippine Islands for 50-some years. Um, Anyway, uh, as, as he said, my name is Dave Hohulan. Um, just give you a little background. I grew up in the Philippines, came back, graduated my senior year from Gibson City, 
went on to Moody Bible Institute, graduated from there and felt that I was not ready to be a pastor or a spiritual leader at that time. I joined the business world and was a, um, a manager of sorts, many different things for about 21 years. I uh, did ministry on the side. I'd preach on the side and teach youth on the side and do Sunday school on the side and do I do gospel magic shows, so I do those too. Uh, but <laughs> after 21 years, uh, my wife's dad got Alzheimer's and we moved back to Illinois to care for him. Uh, he passed away about a year later and then we stayed with her mom another year and a half and she passed away. And by that time we were here, our kids were growing up. And uh, uh, so we stayed here and we've been here the last 20 years. And uh, as the Lord would have it, uh, during that time I was asked to uh, become a full-time youth pastor at Gibson City. and. So I worked with youth for eight years, had a wonderful time with them, and then the Lord called us over to Upper Room in Paxton for 10 years as senior pastor there. And, and then um, through a, a, a number of different things, the Lord just moved us to begin to look at uh, ministry beyond that. You know, I started as a missionary kid. I thought it'd be a great way to end, and I thought perhaps I'd like to do that before my body became too decrepit. So. Uh, at 65 years of age, I, I stepped down as pastor and I became a full-time missionary with Men for Missions. So I uh, travel overseas, I work out of the house, uh, do all my office work there, but I uh, travel overseas quite a bit. I'll be doing a, a number of trips this next year, help lead trips. If anyone here is interested in a short-term trip, we do everything from evangelism to work trips to sports ministry uh, and, and uh, prayer walks as well. So a lot of opportunities over there. Um, just tell you a little something about myself. I'm, I, I live in a little bit of a fog. Um, I, I don't know why. I just kind of live in my own world. Uh, pretty happy there, so it's all good. Um, <laughs> but but because of that, I'm not really aware of anything like style or or what's in. Or um, my wife generally tells me what to wear, uh, which is a, a blessing. Um, but some years ago, one thing I do is I can't hang on to sunglasses. And so some years ago, uh, I always buy them, I want $5 sunglasses because I lose them. So I'm not paying a lot for sunglasses. And it gets harder and harder. You don't find many $5 sunglasses around anymore. Uh, a few years ago, I was out and I was so excited, I found a whole rack of $5 sunglasses. So I bought a pair. And a few weeks later, I was driving and my daughter, my younger, youngest daughter, in her 20s at the time, early 20s, and she's a fashionista, okay? Uh, gets it from her mom, I guess, not from me. Um, so we're riding, and then I put on my sunglasses, we're driving, and she looks over at me, and she begins to laugh. And I said, what? And she said, Dad, are those sunglasses new? And I said, yeah, I just bought them. And she said, Dad, when you bought them, did you look at them? And I said, they were $5. And she said, Dad, they have skulls on them. <laughs> you look like a biker. <laughs> so, um, you know, just I told my, my church the next weekend, I said, if you see me driving around town, you just go, that's our pastor. That's the way he is. It's okay. Uh, but that's a little about myself. Um, I heard recently a story about a young man that was out driving on his way to church one Sunday morning. And... Um, he came up just over, you know, it was in Illinois, one of those little slopey roads. He came up over it, and as he came, a rabbit ran up in front of him, and he hit it. And he felt terrible, so he pulled over and uh, hopped down. He went back to check on the rabbit, and it was indeed very dead. And as he stood there looking at this rabbit, he's just kind of like, well, what now, you know? And a, and a car comes screeching to a halt right in front of him, and a guy hops out, and he walks up, and he looks at the rabbit, looks at the guy, walks to the back, opens the trunk, reaches in, comes out, and he's got a rag and an aerosol can. And he walks up, and he sprays the rag, and he wipes it all over the rabbit. And the rabbit began to twitch, and all of a sudden it just jumped up, and it began to hop away. And it hopped about 10 feet, and it turned around, and it just waved its little paw. <laughs> and it turned around, and it hopped another 10 feet, turned around, and waved its little paw. And it did that all the way up over the little slope until it was out of sight. And, and the guy that hit it is just... He's flabbergasted. He's looking at it, he's watching, he's like, and he turns to the guy and goes, that, that was amazing. You have to tell me what's in the can. And the guy said, oh, this, this is just hair restore with permanent wave. <laughs> I, 
I like that one because you have those that get it at the start and those that get it later, so you get two. Wouldn't it be neat if, if life were like that? Wouldn't it be neat if we could fix everything with an aerosol can? You know, we could just spray the problems away? Because the reality is we live in a really tough world. We live in a world that is broken by sin. And as a result, there's heartache and heartbreak. There's suffering and there's sin. There's stuff that happens to us because of our choices, and there's stuff that happens to us because of the brokenness of this world. You know, we all have friends, relatives, family. They're experiencing hardship, and you may be in the middle of it. It might be health-related. It might be uh, finances. It could be job-related. It could be relationships. It can be any number, or it could be a bunch of them at the same time. And it seems like, and I don't know that this is true, but it feels like almost like it's accelerating, like it's getting harder and harder out there. I, I do know this, that in America, the way that we deal with this is we take drugs. And the level of people on antidepressants is skyrocketing in the United States. Now, there's a time and a place for that sort of thing, but I, I suspect that it's way overused. But it, it tells us something, doesn't it? It tells us we live in a time of anxiety and of fear and of anger and of frustration. And, and as a result, people don't know how to cope. They don't know how to handle it. And, and as a result, they turn to other solutions. But the sad part is, oftentimes we find Christians struggling in the same ways. Now, Christians aren't exempt from these tribulations. The Bible makes clear that we're going to suffer too. Oftentimes I think that we make a mistake in our testimonies when we say, I had a hard life, I met Christ, and everything's been perfect. That's not true, is it? The difference is that life is still hard, but we have Christ. And so we find ourselves in these difficult times, and the question becomes, how are we going to handle it? How are we going to deal with the difficulties? How are we going to deal with the storms? Because, you know, our idea in America is that we want to be um, freed or escape from all troubles. We feel like somehow there should be answers and solutions so we don't have to deal with anything tough. And oftentimes as Christians, we feel like, how could God allow us to go through this? Is God really a loving God? Does God really care about me? that he would put this in my path. Because if he really cared, wouldn't he just remove all that from me? Of course, we know the answer is no, but when you're struggling, it's still tough. Today, I'd like us to look not at whether or not we have these struggles, not at whether or not we have to deal with difficulties, tough times, anxiety, frustration. But instead, I'd like us to look at how we make it through those things. In other words, can we count on the Lord? Can we trust the Lord? Can we find in the Lord the means to deal with this stuff? And I would suggest to you that the Lord answers that question himself. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. And if you want to turn there, that's what we're going to be looking at today. If you are a note taker, write down three words. And I'm a fan of note takers. I really am. Um, you know, they say that people remember, you know, like 80, 85 percent of what they do, but only five percent of what they hear. And, and it's reality. You can hear a great sermon and it's gone like an hour later. Just that's the way we're built. I use. I love doing that on my kids. We'd be driving home from church after I preach. Sometimes I'd say, "How was the sermon?" They'd go, "Great, Dad." And I'd say, "Really? What was it on?" <laughs> Deer in the headlights. Look, you know. It's like. And I don't blame them because we all do that. So if you're a note taker, here's three words to write down. Come, take, learn. Okay? That's the essence of our sermon today. Here it goes. Let's read. The, start with the passage in verse 28 of chapter 11 of Matthew. Jesus is speaking, and he's just, he's just talked about the reality of the fact that he is God, that God has committed everything to him, that he has all power. And, and now he's going to talk to them, and he's going to say, here. so in view of that, here's how you can deal with life. And, and I would suggest to you, it's the idea of finding the eye of the storm, not escaping the storm, 
but finding peace in the middle. You know, I had a friend that was in, I want to say it was Puerto Rico, in the middle of a hurricane, and it was this last year. And he said it was, it was frightening. He said the winds were just tearing things up. There was tin, you know, a lot of the roofs are tin. <laughs> Tin flying through the air, there were trees going down, there were leaves everywhere blowing, rain, thunder, lightning, clouds, everything. And he said, it was just a mess. And he said, all of a sudden, everything went still. The sun came out, it was shining, it was peaceful. He said, we were in the eye of the storm, right in the very center of the storm, and there, there was peace. Well, I would suggest to you as Christians... That there is an eye of every storm where we find peace, and that peace is to be found in Christ. And that's what Christ is going to give us today. He's going to give us the means by which we can find and exist in the eye of the storm, in the middle of the storm. Verse 28, Christ speaking says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So the first thing you'll notice is, come. Come. Come to who? Come to what? You know, so often we think that our answers are found in rules, in regulations. You know, to the, to the Jewish people, it was the law. Come to the law. Everything will be fine there. But what they found is the law was just a signpost pointing them towards something else, but they didn't realize that. And they became overwhelmed and over-enamored by the law, and, and they couldn't keep it. They couldn't keep up with it, right? It was a huge burden. And Christ says... Don't come to the law, come to something. He says, come to someone. Jesus Christ, come to me. Come to me. Now, as Christians, we know that it is relationship because the only way to salvation is through Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. It is only by means of his shed blood that we are forgiven of our sins that we receive the free gift of eternal life. There's nothing we can do to deserve it. And yet it's so easy to get caught up in the stuff I have to do. Right Now understand that on the other end of salvation, there is a life to be lived, but it's a life of gratitude, not of obligation. So Christ says, you know what? Come to me. It's not about the rules. It's not about the regulations. It's justification in me alone. It's, I am the person that you come to because there is relationship to be had with me. Who's he calling? He says, those that are weary. And burdened, and I will give you rest. And, and in the Greek, the, the idea of the weary here is, is not just, man, I slept bad last night, I'm tired. This is a, a continuous state of, of just being worn out. And, and one of the things as a pastor, I can tell you that I heard over and over is people say, I'm exhausted. I am exhausted with life. I feel like I can't keep up. It's overwhelming me. There's just too many things, too many responsibilities, too many difficulties, too many uh, obligations, and, and I can't keep up. And Christ says, you know what? Come to me for rest. That relationship with me is the essential part of where you find true rest. And, and the, the idea of the rest here is not a, re a static rest, but a refreshing rest. Have you ever slept a night, all the night through, and woke up tired? Wrong type of rest, right? But the rest we have in the Lord is a rest that refreshes. It prepares us for the next duty, for the next obligation, for the next responsibility, for the next service that we have in Him. And so we want to recognize that the first and most important thing to finding the eye of the storm is in relationship. It's dealing with life's burdens, all of life's burdens, in the Lord. I'll give you rest. I'll give you refreshment. You know, we've, we've kind of lost that picture. As Americans, we think that we celebrate our busyness, don't we? I am so busy. How many times have you heard that or said that? I am so busy. I had a, a good friend. He was a pastor of a church of about 8,000 people. And he just kept telling his elders over and over and over, I'm so busy, so busy. And, they, and finally, one of the elders said, Brian, whose fault is that? You don't have to be that busy. And he said, you know, I realized that I really held it in my hands. I could choose to be that busy or not. And I was trying to put it off as, oh, I'm just so busy on everyone else. But it really was me. But we've forgotten how to rest. We've forgotten how to be still. There was a purpose to the Sabbath. There was a purpose to that day of rest. And it wasn't so we could fill our lives with other activities, right? 
You know, when I was a kid growing up on the mission field, they wouldn't let us swim on Sundays. I was horrified. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I think maybe that was a little overdone, but there was an element where they really respected that day of rest and were asked people, just step back a little. Catch your breath. Take some rest. What scriptures say? Be still and know that I am God. When's the last time you were still just to spend time with God? Let's find our rest in Christ. Augustine, the uh, apostolic writer, wrote, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. You know, I have been fascinated by people that come and they're just talking about trying to find a way to be at peace, to find rest, to, to, to be able to be still, to be able to not be frustrated. And invariably, they're doing all this stuff and it's not working. And the Lord says, come to me. Come to me. Are you weary? Are you burdened? Come to me. That rest will enable renewed vigor, renewed energy, as we act out our relationship with the Lord in the real world. Number two, take. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, the Jewish people were very familiar with the idea of a yoke. And maybe we aren't so much today. And you know, 100 years ago in the U.S., they would have been. But we don't use yokes too much today, do we? But if, if you aren't familiar with it, a yoke is basically a piece of wood. And it's kind of curved. It was similar to the stick that was up here earlier. But it's kind of curved like this and comes out. And they would take that yoke and they would put it over an ox or a mule. And they would attach it. And that, that animal would pull a plow, that animal will pull a wagon that was uh, a, a burden that they would bear uh, to help them uh, put their energy and effort into it at the right places on their body. And, and to the Jewish people, they talked about the law, the yoke of the law that they put on themselves. In other words, we put this yoke on ourselves and we're straining to follow and obey and keep the law, and it's this huge burden. It's the yoke of the law. And so they talk over and over of that in the Old Testament. Now, in, uh, in the New Testament, they talk about the yoke also. And there they talk about it as more of uh, a metaphorical mark of servitude, of being a servant. In other words, you take that yoke, you're acting as a servant or in service to the Lord. Now, Peter, in speaking about the yoke of the law, said, look, if you remember in Acts 15, he says, look, because the, the Hebrew people were wanting to take the law and tell all the new Gentile Christians, you have to do this stuff too. You have to be circumcised. You have to keep the law just like we do or have. And Peter, at the end of the, the council, the Jerusalem council stands and says, wait a minute, guys. He goes, why, why would we want to put burdens on them that our fathers and ourselves have been unable to keep? In other words, the yoke of the law was overwhelming. It was too heavy a load. But here we have a yoke a mark of service and of servitude to Jesus Christ as being easy, right? As being simple, as not being difficult, as being good. And, and notice what Christ says here. He says, uh, I'm gentle and humble in part. And, and you go, okay, wait, how does that tie to this idea of us taking on a yoke? Well, first of all, as human beings, we rebel at the thought of any sort of service to anything or anyone. We want to be free. We think freedom is the ultimate, but unfortunately, our understanding of freedom is warped because we think freedom is to be free of every outside influence and we ourselves become the decision maker, but that in itself is a trap, isn't it? In fact, scripture says that there's no one that's free. We're all slaves to sin. We will all be servants to something. You will either be a servant to the law, you'll be a servant to licentiousness, or you will be a servant to the Lord. And the Lord says, you know what? My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And he says, I'm gentle and humble in heart. And what's he saying there? He's, think about it a minute. This is God of the universe. In fact, if you were to just flip over to Philippians chapter 2, 
Speaking of Christ, it says, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. So here we have Jesus Christ, God of all. John 1 tells us that everything in the world that was created was created with him involved. In other words, there's nothing that was created that was not created by him. Colossians 1 tells us that not only did he create everything, but that everything holds together in him. In other words, every atom in this universe is held together by the will of Jesus Christ. I often think about the fact that as he hung on that cross, the very atoms of the spikes in his hands, the very atoms of the wood in his back were held together by his will. That's an amazing thought. But isn't it amazing that that God of glory who was surrounded by tens of thousands of angels worshiping him chose to humble himself and come to earth as a human being, lived a simple life. And he, he experienced everything we do. He wept. He was grieved. He was angered by sin. He was frustrated with lack of belief. He was tired. He was hungry. You know, Hebrews tells us that we don't have a high priest who cannot empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one that was tempted in all things just as we are, but he did not sin. In other words, Christ knows what we struggle with. That's why it's important to look at that. He says, I- I'm, I'm humble. I- I'm, 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 he says, uh, I'm gentle and humble in heart. What's that mean? It means he stepped down from his glory to become like us, not so that, he could understand us. He was God. He already understood us, but so that we could know that he understands us. So we could know that he became a servant so that we could understand what true service is and what true freedom is. Isn't it beautiful that the night before he died, his disciples had just been arguing about who was the greatest. You know, I'm going to be the one. I'm going to be the one. And none of them wanted to wash each other's feet because that was a servant's position. That was a slave's position. The, the least of the crowd was the one that did the foot washing. Sometimes a, a host would wash someone's feet as a real example of honor, but you didn't, you lower yourself when you did that. I mean, feet were gross, you know, they were in open sandals and walking where animals were, and I mean, not a happy thing. And Christ takes off his robe, just a cloak on him, gets down on his knees with a basin, and he washes the filthy feet of his disciples. And when you think about it, this is creator of the universe, used to the worship of tens of thousands of angels, on his knees with grungy, dirty feet. And when he finished, he said this. He said, you call me Lord, and you should, right? He didn't say, I'm not God, it's okay. He said, no, this is who I am. In other words, you should be worshiping me, but this is what servanthood looks like. So his yoke is easy and his burden is light because he understands and we know he understands us. And we can trust that service to him is the greatest freedom we'll ever experience. Come, take, last one, learn. And we're going back in the verse a little bit here again. So again, in verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will be filled with rest for your souls. I love that phrase, because he's already said before, I'll give you rest. You'll be filled with rest. for He keeps repeating this rest concept, right? You're going to find rest. You're going to find rest where? In me. You're going to find rest when you take my yoke. You're going to find rest when you learn from me. And the, and the idea of learn here is that we would learn by his words and by his example. I mean, just from that passage we read in Philippians 2, his example was he humbled himself to become like us so we could know he understood us. But he also spoke the words of life. He spoke the words that we need to know, to understand what salvation is about, to understand what submission to our Lord is about, to understand how we might receive eternal life and live with him forever. (coughs) <coughs> he set an example in everything he did. You know, you look at his life, and, and often he challenged those against him. Remember one time, they wanted to take him out, and he says, tell me what I've done wrong. 
any one of you, tell me what I've done wrong, and they couldn't come up with a single thing. I would never do that. <laughs> People would be having lists, you know. Just a minute, Dave, we're busy. But Christ could because he never, ever sinned. He set the perfect example for us. And so we learn by watching his example in prayer. How amazing was he in prayer? Think about it. The Jewish people were people of prayer. They were required at least three times a day to pray. And they usually did it more like eight times a day, okay? They were experts on prayer. And what did his disciples say when they saw Christ pray? Whoa, teach us to pray. I'm thinking, they prayed all the time. There was something so different in Christ's prayer life because it moved way beyond just this words bubbling out of them. It moved to relationship with the Father. And that example was so astounding to his disciples. They're like, that's what we want. That's how we want to pray. And you know what? Christ said, you can do this too. And he taught them how. And so as we watch and we learn from our Lord, we learn how to find that, that peace in the storm because we learn it's not about what's raging around us. It's about the Lord within us. It's about the change that that makes to our lives and the fact that we can deal with everything that comes our way. You know, the sister that just stood up and shared about her husband and what's been going on. You know, and what she say at the end? She said, God is good. Is God still good when something bad happens? He is. About five years ago, I had a knock on our door at 11 o'clock at night. Opened the door and there was a guy standing there. I didn't know. I said, can I help you? And he said, yeah. He said, I've got some bad news for you. Your son was driving home a mile from here. He had a, someone hit him and killed him instantly. And I remember as he said that, I kind of leaned back against the door. I remember what went through my head was Psalm 136, 11. It says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. And I thought, if that's not true now, it's never true. And think about what that says. That says two really important things. First of all, we serve a good God. And secondly, that God loves us. So I can trust that whatever happens, he's got my back. That whatever happens, God holds me in his hands. And you know what? It was amazing how as hard as it was, I mean, we grieved. We still miss him. But you know what? God was with us every step of the way. We just felt such peace. We, we were even, uh, we had the opportunity to write the, the young girl that was just, she wasn't drunk, she wasn't on drugs, she was just being careless. Anyone can make a mistake. And so we wrote her a letter and said, hey, we forgive you. And we want you to know why. It's because our son is with the Lord now. And we trust him. He's a good God. And that girl started responding. And through the years, she's written back a number of times. And she sent flowers on, on his uh, Memorial Day. Um, and just, uh, but, but it's not because we were so strong. It's because we were so weak and God was so strong. And we have such a good God. And so as, as we look at this, I think we need to learn to look to Christ and to take his yoke. And, and to learn the things he teaches. We learn how to pray from him. I'll be honest, I love the study of God's word. I spend, as a pastor, best part of the week, you know. It takes about 20, 25 hours to do a sermon. I love that. People come into counsel, I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> you know, but I love the word. You know what I struggle with? I struggle with prayer. I always have. I'm like the disciples. Lord, teach me to pray. I want to learn better. I'm trying. I'm working at it. You know, Lord, help me to get better at it. But my daughters, when they were little, they got it. These little girls, they were like, yeah, well, let's just pray about everything. And we'd pray at night, and, and they had to bless every animal in the house. We had 24 fish, so it took forever, <laughs> you know? And, 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 but they did. And, and I still remember we had one point, we were taking the neighborhood of kids to, to church. So we had two little cars, and we would, this is back in the days when they weren't quite as strict on seat belts. So they were kind of like stacked like cordwood. You know, we'd just take them to church. And it's like, we needed another vehicle, but we needed like, a, our girls were like, you need a van, Dad. I'm like, yeah, that'd be right. And they're like, we need to pray for one. I'm like, oh, no. You know, and I thought, well, you know, our girls are going to learn that you have to pray at a long time sometimes. You know, it takes the Lord a while sometimes to answer. That's okay. They'll learn a good, a good lesson for that. Okay, let's pray for a van. Next day, I get a phone call from a friend. He goes, Dave, could you use a free van? I'm like, thanks a lot, Lord. My daughters teach me a lesson. 
Two weeks later, we had a friend. His name was uh, Michael. And Michael was doing a ministry down in southern Texas at this tiny little town. He went to this church of about six people. They were all like 80 and up. And our girl's like, Michael needs a wife. And I'm like, yeah, it's not going to happen. <laughs> and they're like, let's pray about it. And I'm like, okay. So we started praying for Michael to get a wife. And two weeks later, Michael calls me and goes, Dave, guess what? I'm engaged. I'm like, are you kidding me? Where'd you meet a girl down there? It was an amazing story. A week later, another friend of mine, he's single, he goes, could your daughters pray for a wife for me? <laughs> they had such faith, and, and I'm trying to learn that God can be trusted with everything, whether it be the little fish in our fish tank, or whether it be a van, or whether it be a friend's wife. And I want to learn how to pray like my daughters did when they were young. You know, just that simple childlike faith. And as, as we look through this, we recognize that God is a God of such love and such care and such goodness for us that where else would we want to be in the middle of the storm than with Christ? Where else would we want to be than coming to him, taking his yoke and learning from him? Who better to learn from than the God of the universe? You know, Chuck Swindoll tells a story about his children praying for his dad, who was not a believer. And he says, we would pray at family devotions for his salvation. And he said, we went out to California to see him, and my son's just full of energy, and boom, he shot down, ran. He saw Grandpa, and he ran up to him. We're still walking back a ways. And he says, my son goes, Grandpa, are you a Christian yet? And he said, Grandpa said, well, no, son, I'm not. And he said, my son said, well, it's all right. You will, because we've been praying for you. And he said, you know, my dad thanked me many times before he passed away for the kids praying for his salvation because he accepted Christ. What a wonderful place to be in the eye of the storm. There was a king that came up with a contest. He said, I want a picture of peace. And there were brilliant paintings made. You know, cows in a pasture a silent, dark forest, a beautiful, quiet, placid lake. But the one that won didn't look peaceful at all. It was the middle of a storm at a waterfall. Water cascading, spraying up, you know, lightning flashing, dark clouds, wind blowing. And if you looked into the waterfall, inside the waterfall, right under the water, there was a little tree that had grown, and there was a branch, and on that branch was a nest. And there was a mother bird sitting in that nest totally at peace. And that won because it got the right idea. Peace is not the absence of difficulties. Peace is something found in the midst of difficulties, the eye of the storm. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so privileged to have a relationship with you. Lord, you make it possible for us to live without anxiety and fear. In your scriptures, you say, be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. And then it says, in the peace of God that surpasses understanding, will fill your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In Isaiah, you say, fear not, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will hold you and help you with my righteous right hand. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that in you we find the peace to live in the middle of this broken wicked, sad world. Lord, your word gives us everything we need to live godly in Christ Jesus, including finding the peace that comes only from you. We thank you for your gift to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing about our Savior. Let's sing Lamb of God. Would you stand, please?
to walk upon this guilty side to you become the Lamb of God Oh Lamb of God sweet Lamb of God I love the Holy Lamb of God Oh wash me in His precious blood my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Your gift of love they crucified. They laughed and scorned him as he died. The humble king they named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. O oh, Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died, but you have brought me to your side to be led by your staff and rod and to be called a Lamb of God. Oh, Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the whole blood till I am just a lamb of God. You're dismissed. <laughs>